We're going to be dealing with the judgments of God. And we're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 9. And then we'll look at verse 10. And I'm going to explain things as easy as I possibly can. So go ahead and turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll look at verse 9 and then we'll look at verse 10. And I want to do this in such a way that I make it so easy you can understand, but I'm not going to make it so easy that it becomes shallow. I don't want to do that, God forbid, but I, uh, I'm not a very deep guy, and everybody laughs because you know it's true, but I am a simple man, and so I want to make this as simple as possible. So, now, you found your place in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, and then we're going to look at verse 10. We know according to the scripture there will be two judgments. Uh, One for the believer and one for the non-believer. The judgment for the believer is called the judgment of Christ. Or the judgment seat of Christ, we also call the Bema seat. And so, and then the judgment for the non-believer is called the great white throne judgment. And so, we need not to mix the two up. Uh, The judgment or the Bema seat of Christ is for the believer. And the judgment, which is called the great white throne judgment, is for the non-believer. Each one of these judgments are often misunderstood or overlooked. And I mean this. To the believer, the Bema seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ is sometimes thought of as something awful, horrible, you know, unpleasant. Because it has to happen before the joys of experience in heaven and being with your loved ones and seeing Jesus Christ. It's going to be a horrible time. Yes and no. To the non-believer, the great white throne judgment... Uh, is denied or thought of as some fictitious fictitious religious idea. Well, we're not going to be dealing with the great white throne judgment tonight. We're just going to focus on the Bema Seat of Christ. And then next week, if God allows, we'll deal with the great white throne judgment. Regardless of a person's position on the subject of the judgments, each is undeniable according to Scripture. We can't get away from it. Uh, Our lives are like our... We're from Alabama, and everybody knows that. You've heard so many redneck stories. But the scary thing about Alabama is you have the Redstone Arsenal, and you have portions of of NASA. We have the Space and Rocket Center and some really exciting things. So when you go home, when we go home to Alabama, and we're driving through Huntsville, we see that big rocket, and we know we're close to the house, you know, because there's the rocket. Rednecks and rockets. It just doesn't, I don't get it. But... You know, I've never been able to go to Florida and see one of these space shuttles take off. But there's always a countdown. I was born March 21st, 1978. And uh, that's when my countdown took place. The countdown to the judgment seat. Because every knee shall bow. The day you were born was the countdown to the day you're going to meet Jesus Christ face to face. And you will have to answer to him. Whether you're lost or saved To what degree, we'll discuss that as we go. Each one of these judgments will be executed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture is clear. Who's going to be judging us? Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says in John chapter 5 verse 23 that Jesus is giving the authority to judge every man. Because why? The Father has given all judgment to the Son according to this passage of Scripture. The the book of James, chapter 5, verse 26 and 27, states that Jesus will judge the world. See, Jesus is our Savior here on earth. But when it's all over with, he'll be our judge. And that's very important for you to understand. When it comes to the judgment or the Bema Seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. So now, let's just focus on uh, the Bema Seat of Christ, which is... And I'll explain that as we go. Some of you are like, what does Bema mean? Well, we'll explain that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Therefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, which is Jesus. Verse 10. For we, for we believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or or bad, we're all going to have to give an account of what we've done here on earth in this body, whether it be good or bad. Once again, we're dealing with the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, which is the judgment of the believers. So don't get this mixed up. 
with those that are lost, those that are non-believers, because we're not dealing with that. That's a whole different time period. Don't take place at the same time. It's a whole different scenario. So focus on this. This is just believers standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin our study by examining the Bema seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ. And then we'll look closer at the great white throne judgment next week. So I'm going to give you the good news tonight. We'll, we'll deal with the bad news next week, okay? The Bema seat of Christ, the believer's judgment by Christ himself. Um, having, uh, having a proper biblical understanding of this event will help us uh, remove fear. It'll also help us to prepare ourselves to see Jesus Christ or to be ready to stand before Jesus Christ. It'll motivate us as believers if you have a better understanding what is the Bema seat of Christ. So we're going to cover it and make it real simple. Uh, we're going to deal with a couple of things. When will it happen? We're going to also talk about are we judged for the sins we've committed? Uh, what are the criteria? Will what criteria will we be judged on? And what are the rewards slash crowns that will be given? And uh, remember, life is short. It's even a vapor appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. The Bible makes it clear when it does vanish of the way. We will all be judged. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the what? The judgment. So, when will it happen? Good question. When will this take place? Uh, I, I, I know that um, according to the scripture, it makes it very clear in some ways. And sometimes we'll look at portions of scripture and say, I'm not exactly sure how to interpret that. The judgment of believers will occur immediately following the rapture. Uh, as Pastor Tony's already discussed the rapture, you know that's the taking away of the, the calling up of the church. The timing of the judgment seat of Christ is given in the following scriptures. Luke chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. When you first read this, you're going to go, I don't understand how that has anything to do with the rewards in having it take place at the rapture. Well, I'll explain. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. This portion of scripture is in prior verses to this. It explains how we on earth, in the body, as the Bible says in Corinthians, are to live for Jesus Christ. And there's going to be things and ministries that we do, reaching out to the poor and the lame and the weak. And we're going to minister to them. But don't expect things here on earth to be given to you for doing that. You'll be blessed. But those people aren't going to be the ones that maybe are in your class or on the bus or so on and so forth or go to the food pantry, they're not really going to be giving you anything in return. Your reward will be when? At the resurrection of the just. Revelations 22 and verse 12 states, I come quickly and my reward is with me. So when will it happen? When will we stand before the beaming seat of Christ? It is at the resurrection. Because there's multiple scriptures that reveal that it is at that moment. Well, like I said, Revelations 22 and verse 12 states, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And he makes the statement in Luke chapter 14 that the things here on earth, yes, you'll be blessed. But when will you receive your rewards? The resurrection of the just at that moment. Well, the Bible says when the Lord returns with his bride in Revelations chapter 19, verse 8, they're already, they already received the, the reward. So we know it takes place before the return of Christ with his bride. It is at the rapture, the resurrection of the saints. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, remember, the righteous judge, he's the judge, shall give me at that what? At that day, which speaks of the rapture. And not, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So this is another reference that makes us believe that it is at the, uh, it's at the uh, resurrection or at the uh, rapture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 12. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord what? Cometh. Or come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. 
It's at that moment God will reveal the heart, what you're worthy of, what you've done, whether it be uh, good or bad, as we read in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It will be revealed on that day, and that day will be at the rapture. Now, does that mean when we meet him in the air, boom, at that moment? I don't know. Does that mean we meet him in the air, then we step into the realms of glory? I don't know. All I know is this. I do not believe we're going to stand in line with millions and billions of people waiting our turn. I think God is God enough, all-powerful enough, within a split second, he could reveal the good and the bad of our life and reward us accordingly if he wanted to. Now, will he or will he not? I don't know. We haven't sat down and talked about it. <laughs> All that matters is this. It will be, it will happen at the rapture. Is that clear? And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 5, rewards are associated with that day, and that day is considered the Lord's coming. Again, for the church, which is speaking of the rapture. So that's just a simple way to get your mind around the fact that this day is coming. The day of judgment, the bema seat of Christ, and it will be at the rapture. It's not going to be, hey, it's not going to be when the great white throne judgment and the sinners are standing before him. It's separate. That's a whole different event and a whole different time. Okay? So, now, second of all, we are not judged for sin. We're not judged for sin. I grew up with the idea that there's going to be a big screen. And so Pastor Tyler, he, he grew up this way too. We were joking around about this. Go to camp meeting and they say, man, you're going to stand before God and everything you did will be shown to the whole world. And you'll stand there with shame and embarrassment. And I'm like, hey, five-year-olds are trembling over the cookie they took. We are not judged for the sin. Will we be judged here on earth for the sins we've committed? Yes, there's consequences for sin. But I know what the Bible says. The Bible says, God himself says, for your sins, your sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. Psalms 103 verse 12 says, our sins are as far as the east is from the west. That's a long way away. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. They are buried in the depths of the sea. They are forgotten by God because the blood of Jesus Christ has covered them. I want you to know, take heed, understand, we are forgiven. We're washed as white as snow. Now that sounds good, Pastor Dave, but <laughs> what about the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that said, we will have to give an account. What's that talking about? I mean, if we're not going to be judged for sin, what is the account? Let's read. Listen to it carefully, okay? And I'll explain. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body, in his body, man or woman, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So let me break it down. This kind of goes back to what is Bema seat? What does that mean? Well, this kind of explains why we're not going to be judged by our sins. The word judgment here is not, is not the Greek word uh, krima. Krima is the Greek word that defines judgment throughout the New Testament. This particular word is translated bima in the Greek. Remember, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So to break it down and make it simple, it's basically like this. We are not judged by condemnation, judgment, punishment, damnation. That's not what this word judgment here means. The judgment seat of Christ is not translated in the Greek to mean any of those things. It's translated to mean bima, which represents reward. You say, well... Why would you think that? Because when we study the time of Christ, Bema was a location, a place, a rock that was a platform where the authority would sit there upon and judge people according to what they have done. It was a, a, a place of authority to give judgment. Well, Paul is speaking to the church, uh, the Corinthians, and the Cor uh, church of Corinth. Whenever he, there was a game that took place in Corinth, uh, there was these special athletes would meet together 
and perform, they would also stand before the bema. And he's referring in this passage of scripture, not to damnation, not to punishment or judgment. He's referring to reward. Because he's looking at the fact that the bema that we stand before is the circle of those that are winners and champions. He is saying, I, even himself in the book of Acts, stood before the bema. He stood in that area. And this is why so many times we see in portions of scripture, so many times we see in portions of scripture that there's references that Paul makes dealing with uh, the, the athletes and the games and so on and so forth. So, excuse me, it's not the book of Acts. I don't know why I said that, but making reference to this. What is the Bema seat then? Paul says, let me make it clear. This is not a place of judgment for your sins. They're washed white as snow. This is a place where all of those that are due their just reward will be given that reward. It's the Bema seat, just as we saw in the games of Corinth. They stood before the Bema seat and received a crown for the rewards that they were given. Wonderful thought because this, is, this takes place in the believer's life. This is not just an award ceremony like we see the Tony Awards or we see different things that the People's Choice Awards or the Grammys. This event should not be scary to us because this is the biggest award ceremony that's ever been known to man. It's the Bema Seat. And I love this because the Bible goes on further to say, According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Whoa, what about that word bad there? I thought we weren't dealing with sin here. We're going to be judged for the good and the bad. What does that mean? Well, according to this passage of scripture, uh, the Greek word for bad is translated here useless or worthless. In other portions of scripture found in the New Testament, it's translated for evil. So Paul is saying, I'm telling you, the word judgment, he says, is dealing with bima, a place of reward. But also, it's a place where you will be judged at the bima seat for the good and the worthless. Not evil, not sin, worthless. You say, aren't they the same thing? Mm, no. I, I remember there's many times Christian and me will be doing something or he, he has a privilege of playing his Xbox and he'll stay up. And, and he, we give him three hours of technology time, and sometimes he'll go over, and I said, you could have did this, you could have did that, and you could have did that. Well, well, I didn't have time. Well, wait, 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 what do you mean you didn't have time? You didn't have time to clean your room? You spent four hours on the Xbox. Was that evil? Well, if he disobeyed me, yes, but <laughs> maybe this ain't a good example. No, it was worthless time. You're not an evil person for playing Xbox, but you wasted the time you were given. Good and the bad, and the bad being the worthless things. The Bema Seat is going to be a wonderful ceremony, an award ceremony. The only thing that will be at the coming of the Bema is praise and reward. <laughs> Sin will already be done away with. It has already been exposed and it has already been covered by the cross of Jesus Christ. Now it's time at the rapture to stand before Jesus Christ and at the Bema seat for him to look at you and say, let me examine the things that you have done in the body on earth as a believer, all the good things, doing the Father's will and the things that you wasted your time on. And then he exposes it. Now, so with that in mind, what... What criteria will be, will be judged? What, what criteria will we ju be judged on? What are these things we will be judged on? I mean, if it's not sin, explain it to me. The Bible says, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, right? In other words, be consumed, as, as long as you're on earth here, be consumed with the kingdom of heaven, not the things of earth. If you want to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, he says, don't be entangled with the affairs of this life, that ye may please him who hath chosen you to be a soldier. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But verse 20, But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. He says, listen to me. Huh. You have an opportunity 
while you're here on earth, to lay up your treasures, to set your affections on things above, and do the things worthy of reward. But through those circumstances, there's going to be some things that you're going to do that are useless, that the church through tradition has made them as if they are going to be rewarded. But I'm going to tell you, they're not evil, they're bad, and they're not profitable for you when you get to glory. Does that make sense? So what are these things? Let me, let me break it down. Let me make it simple for you. I think sometimes the easiest way is to explain it is by the next portion of Scripture. So I like the way he illustrates this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 through 14. The Bible says we're laborers together with God. We're God's husbandry. You're God's building. God's people at a work. There's a foundation that's laid that Paul said. I laid the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Nothing else. If somebody comes along and says, nope, it's this. No, don't listen to them. You build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. You do the work of an evangelist. You do the work of a Christian. You be the light of the world. You do the things that are worthy of reward in heaven. Because in the end, the Bible goes on to say, in the end, huh, it is like this, verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, which is Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifested, for the day shall de declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work for what sort it is. If a man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So what does that mean? Let me put it this way. It simply means this. You work for the Lord Jesus Christ and examine scripture. What is the will of the Father in the book of Matthew? What does God want us to do with the life we have until the countdown's done? Because all that will matter in order to receive a reward. Those are the things that don't burn up. Those are the, the gold, the silver, the precious stones. But there's other things that are beneficial, they're nice, they're good things, but they're kind of worthless when you get to heaven. Let me give myself as an example. We're getting ready for dinner show. We're going to minister to people through the dinner show. And I want to illustrate this just a little bit here. I, I'm putting together things like in the foyer of the church. I put the table together and spend hours doing all that and do the display and so on and so forth. And it looks really cool. But when I stand before the Bema Seat of Christ... He's going to go, Dave, you had an awesome opportunity for all these years you were on earth. Yeah, I know, God. Did you see some of the things I built? Yeah, I saw it. And everybody acknowledged it, and you got a pat on the back. Yeah, but, buddy. Yeah, and I know your heart, Dave. Remember, you were like, yeah, yeah, I spent a long time on that. It was pretty hard work. Yeah, it's done, Dave. Look, it's gone. It's gone. What do you mean, Lord? That's not what matters. Those are the bad things. Those are worthless things. That's not the main thing. What's the main thing, Lord? Preach the gospel. Well, we had to minister to people. You know, the web, the web family, you all got together and got money together. Remember what I, that portion of scripture, reaching out to the poor, the lame, the blind, the people in need? People in need, the body? That's worthy. Oh, God, but what about the other stuff? It's not bad, Dave. It's not a bad thing in the sense of being evil. It's bad in the sense of you're so consumed with those things that you lost, you lost track of time. What do, you, what do you mean I lost track of time? Who are you? Who are, I'm God, Dave. I know what's going on here. Just quiet now. I'm looking here, Dave. I'm looking at your record. What was done in the body here on earth you got consumed with? You know your junior church? You spent 45 minutes playing games and 10 minutes giving the meat of the word. Dave, let me tell you, 45 minutes of playing games, it's gone, Dave. I'm trying it by fire. That's wood. That's the hay. That's the stubble. It's the worthless time you spent. I read my Bible through in a year. Three chapters a day, four on the weekend. And God said, that's good. You read your Bible through a year. Do you remember any of it? God, I read my Bible through. No, I said, did you learn it? Did you study the show thyself approved? Did you consume it? Did you put it in your heart? Did you hide God's word in your heart? No, I, I, well, I, I went to a, a little dinner we had in the class, and everybody that read their Bible through got a certificate. Yeah, here's your certificate. 
there's going to be a lot of smoke in heaven. You know that? He said, Dave, those are, those are good things. I'm not saying they're evil. But what matters most is your heart. What are you doing with the heart? What matters is God says, I'm looking at your heart and the rewards you're going to receive, the things you're going to receive are what I put in the God's word. It is building my kingdom. It's going out and telling others about Jesus Christ. It's being a servant. It's suffering. It's, it's going against all odds and being righteous. That's what matters most. He said, all the rest, well, it's just going to burn up. You see, we're judged by fire. Every human will be judged by fire. Those that are unbelievers will be judged by the fire at the great white throne judgment when they're cast into hell. But those that are, that are believers, that's non-believers, those that are believers will be judged by the fire that will consume the worthless time we spent on the things that we thought were so important. Are they evil? No. But they're not going to benefit you in the long run. Are they necessities? Yes, they are. But this is why the Bible says a false balance is an abomination. We have to have those things. Hey, we got to have a sign-up table. Looks cool so people can come to the dinner show and then we dress real cool like pirates. But in the long run, we do all that fluff to get money to a family in need and to have fun and fellowship with you guys because we're a church family and we need that too. Which brings me to the next question. What are the rewards and crowns? At the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord will examine the works of all the believers. But did you know that he will also reward us for our godly choices in life? Hence, the things we do for him, to honor him. Through righteous living, we earn a number of different honors and rewards. Let me put it this way. This is so funny. I'm going to kind of say it this way, okay? I was in junior high school. And I had a teacher named Mr. Bender. I'm going to close out with this. And Mr. Bender gave me a, a book report, <laughs> On the Hobbit. So I got to thinking, that is an awful thick book to read. And I'm not a reader. I don't know if I want to read the book on the Hobbit. So I thought, what's the next best thing? Get the cliff notes. There were, I couldn't find any cliff notes. Maybe I was too stupid to even find cliff notes. I don't know. But I couldn't find any. I don't need you to say amen. So what's the next best thing when you're in junior high? Get the movie. Only problem is, the movie The Hobbit... Doesn't come out until 2012. This is in the 90s, folks. I can't get The Hobbit, the movie. So what's the next best thing? Get the cartoon. It was out, and I got it the night before. Isn't our life kind of like a book report? We got Jesus, the teacher, the one that grades us according to what we do. And we just lollygag around. We were like, man, I, I got six months to get this book report done. Six months. Plenty of time. Play Xbox. Go play with my friends. Ride my bike. We're Christians. We go through life. I got plenty of time to get rewards. To lay up my treasures in heaven. I got things to do. I got places to go. Kind of like the book report. And then it gets closer and closer. And the Bible says it's like a thief in the night. He's going to come. Boom. And you're like. Whoa. That's how I was when Mr. Bender says. Don't forget your book reports due tomorrow. He really didn't talk like that, but it sounds good. And I'm like, tomorrow. So, I didn't even have the Hobbit at Blockbuster. I had to go to the library and get it. I could have just got the book. And, but anyway, so I, get the, I sit down and I'm watching the movie. And I'm thinking to myself, this, I don't know if this is legit with the book. But I'm going to do the best I can. So I start writing my report. And let me tell you something. Mr. Bender is going to grade me on my book report. What, the time he knows I spent with it. The fluff in the book report. Teachers know fluff. I'm putting stuff like hobbits have big feet and hairy toes. They live in the ground. And they like substance like waffles to eat. I threw that one in there. There was nothing in there about waffles. But I started watching it and I put things together. And then I brought my book report to Mr. Bender. Then he brought me the report back after grading it with a very low grade. And the words, next time read the book and use your time wisely. What's the point? The nature of your reward is basic. It's like a book report. 
It's going to be wonderful. You're going to be rewarded for the good deeds you've done here on earth. He loves you. He wants to reward you. And he's given you plenty of time to get it done. Within the, with the idea in the back of your mind, life is short. It's even a vapor appear for a little time. And that's just a little prod to say, I'm not going to give you the date in which you'll die. I'm just going to make you think you might die tomorrow. So live today as if you'll die tomorrow and get the work. And until then, you're going to be working for an eternal reward, as Matthew chapter 6 says. And these rewards you're going to get are different degrees, as the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, 11 through 12. It depends on how much you're putting into it, how much you'll get in return. And I close with these rewards. He said, in the end, the, the precious stones, the things as he gave as an example that remain, that don't burn up, are the crowns. I don't know what the crowns will look like. I'm sure they're not going to look like that. That's a funky crown. But it's going to work. Each one of them represents something different. Each one of them are very important. Each one of them you can earn. The crown of victory is the incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And in this crown is received by those who go through difficult times, hardships, trials, and don't give up. Hey, how many of you know somebody like that? I know a lot of people in this church, and I go, how do you do it? How do you do it? You know the ones that throw up their hands and say, quit church, bunch of hypocrites. Man, I ain't been living for God in a long time. I'll stand before God and I'll deal with it then. So on, so forth, blah, blah, blah. That ain't your crown, buddy. Then the crown of rejoicing for the soul winner. Found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 18 through 20. The Bible makes it clear. Paul said there's a crown for those that go out and tell others about Jesus Christ. What is that crown? Those are the ones that are planting the seed. So I didn't actually win them to Christ. I just told them about Christ. Hey, you're doing the will of the Father. There's a crown for those that are laboring in that area. The crown of righteousness. This crown is for those that long for the Lord's return and demonstrate it by living righteously. The third crown, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Those are, this is the crown that people go, man, I am so tired of going to school and trying to stand up for what's right. Junior high and high school, and then I got to go to college and abstain from all fornication. And then you get married, and then you, you're tempted by adultery. No, no, no. I'm going to live righteously. I'm going to watch the things that are righteous. I'm going to discipline my family and help them because it all needs to be based on the foundation. Jesus Christ, as Paul said. He said, I'll reward you. Don't give up. I know it's hard teaching your kids and being consistent and not allowing them rebellion, creep in the house and unrighteousness. And then the fourth crown, the crown of life, James chapter 1 verse 12 speaks of. People who uh, preserve through tribulation and, and get reward, they, they don't give up in temptation and so forth. And then the crown, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, the crown of glory. I love this crown because it deals with the leaders of the church. Not just pastors, but the leaders of the church, the Sunday school teachers, are the ones that are investing. The ones that go out of their way and do the very best they can. And God says, man, you didn't compromise my word. You studied it. You were concerned about the little ones. You got involved. By the way, church pew warmers don't get this. They're the ones that get the work. Find a job and get the work. Put your hand to the plow. Get the work. This is the ones that went out of their way to present the gospel and the truth. And then in the end, what's the purpose of it all? What's the purpose of it all at the Bema Seat of Christ? The purpose is in Revelation chapter 4, 10 through 11. To cast them before the feet of Jesus. Bottom line is, nobody wants to go to a award ceremony with nothing in return. You don't want to sit there during the Awana program when you're a little kid and go, and my name was never called out. You don't want to be an athlete and never be rewarded for the things you've done. I do not want to be a believer and stand before a living God and not have anything in return. I have a life to live and a little bit of time to do it. It's like a book report. You're going to be graded on the things you do and your just reward as a believer, are the crowns we lay at his feet.